I'm Travis Bader, and this is the Silver Core Podcast. Join me as I discuss matters related to hunting, fishing, and outdoor pursuits with the people and businesses that comprise the community. If you're new to Silver Core, be sure to check out our website, www.silvercore.ca, where you can learn more about courses, services, and products that we offer, as well as how you can join the Silver Core Club, which includes 10 million in North America wide liability insurance to ensure you are properly covered during your outdoor adventures. If you are interested in learning how to hunt or are a dormant hunter and would like a refresher, Silver Core has created an online hunter education program, which is the official online course of the BC Wildlife Federation. Included in the cost of this course is the mandatory $30 graduation certificate fee for anyone wishing to hunt in British Columbia. Check the link in the description for more details. Today I'm joined by the host of the Hunting Dog Podcast, recurring guest on Meat Eater, passionate upland game hunter, dog handler, and all-around cool guy, Ron Bame. Ron, I'm really excited to be chatting with you on this Hunting Dog Silver Core Swapcast. Cool. cool. You, know, yeah, you wrote me, Travis, and uh, you said one key word to speak my interest. You're thinking about getting a bird dog. I am thinking so, about getting a bird dog, yes. So what was... What, why would you do something so stupid? Honestly, <laughs> so I've, I've had dogs before. Previously, I had a uh, border collie and smart as a whip, easy mm -hmm. to train, had it trained doing everything I wanted, but, uh, but not as a hunting dog. Um, right. The kids had kids come on the way and we realized we weren't giving the dog the attention that it needed. And uh, we have two kids that needed our attention and I didn't feel that we were being fair to the dog. So, I mean. The kids would say, oh, our dog's living on a farm now. Well, it actually was. We found some farmers who had some property who could take care of the dog and give it the attention it needed. And I was always of the mindset, I'm not going to get myself another dog until we got a large property. And I want to get a couple because they're, they're pack animals. They, they want the company. And recently out hunting, I came to the very sudden realization, I am tired of retrieving my own birds and I would love to have a dog. And th this happened after about, I don't know, three hours of trying to find a bird that went down and just couldn't find it. And finally had some other hunters yeah. come by and they had dogs and they were able to help out. So I said, time to get a dog, texted the wife. And she's immediately looking at, at all these different breeds and we're kind of, we're kind of looking at monster landers, but you probably have some ideas on those, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, what I was going to ask you. Who isn't, you would not be, you are so not alone in this world of how to pick a breed. Right. Because back in the day, if it was kind of always the guy met the guy that he was hunting with and he got a dog from his friend. And now the wife and the kids always come into the equation. Right. And, and they get online and they start reading breed descriptions and you could read, I got several books. I got an encyclopedia over there of all the dog breeds. I've got that great book that, uh, Craig Koshik, a follow, a fellow Canadian friend of a, or a fellow Canadian of yours, yeah, yeah, wrote this wonderful book, and it breaks down every continental breed that points in this okay. particular book, and it gives you kind of an explanation and he tells you the pros and cons, but you'll fall in love with every dog you read on that. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that's the thing. Does it say, yeah. <laughs> so the, what I was getting at, there's so many families that get involved with picking a dog. Mm. And the minute you said your wife on the inside, I'm going, yeah, you got it. You know, <laughs> it's not just a dog. It's going right. to be another kid of some, some fashion, you know? Yeah. Agreed. But, but, the, but the upside I tell everybody, and I probably filter three or four calls a day and they end up getting to be long calls with people looking for a first dog. Okay. And when I know okay. someone's got, uh, that they haven't done it before. I literally ask them two different questions. One of them is always, are you married? Mm. <laughs> and, yes. And then I, they're like, yeah, it's okay. Do you have kids? And they said, yeah. How old? Uh, five and seven. Okay. You're not going to have a problem if you raise that dog and you've got kids that you're, you know, 85% happy with, you'll be mm. able to raise a dog. Right. But it's just like you've probably met somebody with that first kid. And they, 
they think they're they don't know what to do and everything's an emergency and everything's this and everything's that um the worry right. wart part of right. being a parent if you're not a worry wart parent you got a pretty good kid you're i don't care if kids three or 13 if you did a pretty good job you're going to do a good job with your dog whatever breed you get so awesome there's a awesome. silver there's a silver lining absolutely silver <laughs> silver lining for silver core yeah well our kids are what 14 and 12 right now and uh i don't know i think we're doing a good job with them got a good family good. unit part of about getting this dog though i said look at everyone's got to be on the same page so we're buying yeah. some books on training the dog and what, what is one of them the, the gentleman's hunting dog i think was uh mike stewart and there's uh, another book a smaller one a lot of really good information that we're going through right now but i said I don't want to train at one thing and have you guys do something different. We got to be right. unified in our approach. Yeah. Well, that's, that's going to be important. Um, so what, what kind of birds up in your neck of the woods would you be chasing forest grouse mostly? Are you in uh, what part of Canada? So we're, I'm in the lower mainland area and I'm fortunate enough where I live. I mean, we got some great waterfowl hunting. So we've got some oh, nice. Yeah, great uh, ducks and geese. Uh, in the area where I'm at, actually, they've got a club that'll release pheasants, and so we could do some pheasant hunting. Uh, and then you don't have to travel too far, and we've got a lot of uh, grouse hunting. And all my grouse cool. hunting in the past has been, okay, let's let's walk the roads and look out for the guard grouse and uh, yeah. just try and keep, keep my eyes open. So having a dog will be a completely different dynamic. It will be. And... You know, especially like the breed you're talking about, the the Munsterlander, I've judged a lot of them over the years. Okay. And one of the parts of the versatile hunting dog test is a, a, a puppy needs to track a live pheasant. So we disable this pheasant from being able to fly with both wings, and we release it on the ground out of sight of the dog, and we basically shoo it away, like, go, 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 right? Right. And... In an ideal situation, you're in maybe six inches of cover, like a hay field or something like that, or a stubble field or something. And ideally, that bird runs into some other cover, like a fence row or a woodlot or something. We set this up, and I've said this probably 50 times on my podcast, but I haven't said it to you or your sure. listeners. Um, as judges, we, we, we cringe sometime when we're like, oh, is this a good spot? Are we giving the dog the best we could give it? Like the cover's kind of sparse. It's kind of just mostly mud or the cover's too tall or, you know, mm. we always, we could judge the field search of a dog because you're watching the dog run. No big deal. Right. But the track is really important because it's up to us to set up a good track. Right. And we can, and this has happened dozens of times. Let's say we get a couple of other dogs that aren't, I'm not going to say what breed. They're just not Munsterlanders. Sure. And the first couple just, that dog just didn't inherit a lot of tracking or it used kind of a wild search to track. And, and, and the dog can still get some qualifying points, you know, as long as he's making forward progress. Mm. But as judges, we're always like, oh, I knew we should have found a different field. We, <laughs> we, and then third dog up is a small Munsterlander. And the person puts the dog out on the track and it looks like a bloodhound chasing a prisoner right through the swamp, you know? It really? Just, okay. It's just, now there is the exception to the rule, but I mean, the exception is rare and the rule is strong. Munsties have a hell of a tracking instinct, a hell of a tracking instinct. Well, know? that's good to hear. That's good to hear. So that lost bird you looked for forever mm -hmm. and ever, mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Well, amen. That's awesome. So I guess the next question would be, so you get, you get this as a pup and I think we're, where is it? We're looking at, um, somewhere in the States, I, we've, there's a breeder out there, so we'll have to fly in, grab it when it's a, uh, a few months mm -hmm. old. Like at what age do you, do you start their training at? Well, training kind of starts the day you get at home. You'll hear people say that. Okay. But it really does because dogs learn they only can learn by association. So it's either they're, they got seven inherited, a pointing dog has seven inherited traits. Okay. Obedience and understanding English language is not one of them. Okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. so there's desire, there's search, there's nose, there's tracking, there's water, cooperation, 
those things come in the package, but the training starts just like with crate training. Um, you know, I don't know with your border collie, if you crate trained it for travel and for the home or did you let it become a bed puppy and deal with a couple accidents in the house back in the day? No, no bed pups. I've, I was raised with having dogs as an outside only dog. Yeah, uh, yeah. our new dog that we'll be bringing in will have a crate inside the house. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of torn between the utility of a dog as well as the, the fact that like you're saying, you know, the kids and the wife and everyone, it's becomes part of your family. Right. Right. So that crate is like your, your pup's first bedroom. Mm. Uh, so like when we have kids, they sleep in a bassinet nearby so mom can feed them and everyone's worried about the new kid. I tell you, when you bring home a new puppy, let's say, let's hope it's not before eight weeks of age. I, it should be, okay. I think 10 or 12 is well proven to be a better age to pick them up. If it's a good kennel, yeah. it's really developing their pups. And honestly, that keeps you from having less house accidents at 12 True. weeks. Yeah, exactly. It does it. They, they just have a more developed bladder and, and food system. But so when you bring that dog home, you set that crate. I tell people, set that crate up by a door, closest door to your yard. And when you put that puppy in, when you don't have time to play with the puppy, which would be outside, taking walks, a little bit of house with the kids. Of course, they're going to hold them and watch TV with them and all that stuff. Sure. But when you don't have time with the for the pup, just put them in a crate. And he's going to howl a little bit. And he's probably going to howl the first time you shut the door and you go to bed. Mm. But what kid didn't cry the first time you put him in his own crib in his own room? Right. And what mother didn't tell their daughter, don't you go in there? Because if you go in there once, <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. That baby, that baby can only learn by association. So you can't tell the baby, it's okay. I'll be back in the morning, and when you wake up at three, I'm going to nurse you. You, mm. you know, you can't it reason work. with a baby. You can't reason with a puppy. Right. So you put him in that crate, and you never let him out when he's barking or crying. I mean, there's exceptions. Like, right. you got to make sure that he's already emptied his bladder, mm. you know, and maybe maybe made the, the, the poop in the backyard or whatever. Sure. Or maybe he already pooped on your carpet. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but you don't want to put him in there if – there's a chance that he really has to go to the bathroom. Mm. Other than that, even adult dogs can sleep 20 some hours a day when you're not doing nothing, you know, a, a right. regular house dog. Right. And uh, so you get him used to that crate and that just starts that, that crate training. Like, no, it's not about me right now. It's about, it's about, no, it's quiet time. Mm -hmm. now, my mom used to, she'd been gone for a long time, but she get, she kid it around. Now, my mom was, you know, I was born in the 50s. So my mom would go next door and have cigarettes and coffee with a neighbor and plop me in a in a plate. You know, back in the day, they had four foot square wooden play pens, right? Yeah, yeah. She says, you were raised in a play pen for like two years. She goes, I didn't do anything with you. <laughs> <laughs> kids are easy. <laughs> yeah, kids are easy. <laughs> and I could, you know, give me a toy and I was fine, like a dog with a chew toy. But yeah. I, I keep that with the dog. It's like when you don't have the time, put it in a kennel. He is not going to resent that once he gets used to the kennel. That's good to you know. know. So, so when you ask, when does this training start? That's part of it. The next training on that is in the beginning, you, your kids, your wife are going to open that crate door and he's going to come running out like, ah, I'm here, you know? Yeah. And of course you got to let him out to the door. You always, they'll always relieve themselves after a nap pretty much most of the yeah. time. And but after that's developed a little bit, you take that door <clears throat> and you kind of, when they come charging out, you snap it in their face a little bit. Like, ah, ah. Mm. Nah, ah, ah. <clears throat> and he's going to keep banging his, <laughs> it's, it is a dog. It's not a kid. So you're not going to get child services after you. Right, right. Um, and j I always say, picture yourself trying to get out of a, uh, let's say, have you ever used a porta john on a job site? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those doors on them Porta Johns can be weird, right? Yeah. They can swing back and like you get your hand caught in them once you're like, ah, uh -uh, no, I know. Porta John door needs to go all the way out because yep. it's spring loaded 
And if I'm not all the way out the door, it's going to come back and hit me. And for some reason, a porta john door is grosser than, you know. Sure. So the dog's going to think the same thing. You, 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 you give him a note. Nope. You close that door. And then the minute he kind of is like, should I come out or should I not come out? You open that door a little bit and you get a couple inches out and then you say, okay. Now he starts learning. Okay. Means it's okay. Right. And you develop that over a few, a few weeks, right. To the point where when you go to let him out of that door, you're going to go, ah, uh ah, uh -uh. And then you're going to open that door. That door is going to be open 180 degrees and he's going to be sitting in there. She, and yeah. he's going to be like, say the word, say the word. Okay. You know, you're going to go, okay. Right. And then he's going to come out. He's going to come out just like he did when he first got home. He let him out. Happy puppy. But he already learned that he's got to wait a little bit. Right. You know? So what that does is it establishes you as making the rules for the dog. Mm. And that's where so many people go wrong. Just those little things like that. When you go to the door, once he's learned the, the kennel door, you do the same thing at the house door. You, as you go out the door, you never let the dog take the lead. You, you say, uh, uh, you know, it, it, don't worry about teaching the dog to sit. I, 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 I won't ever go into that pointing dog. Some people that never train them to sit, sit, sits a default for a dog. If they don't know what to do, they're going to sit. Ah, um, okay. you give it, if you want to give it a name, Give it a name. But if you don't, I guarantee you, if you keep opening a door and your dog's trying to get out, at some point he's going to go like, I guess I'll just sit. You know, <laughs> so they're going to sit. Interesting. Or, or, okay. Right. So then you start doing the house door and he sees that house door goes open. You get one step out under the threshold and then say, okay. And then he comes out with you, but you take the lead. So, so that training starts early on. It, so that's just associative training, how to be a good puppy at home, you know? Yeah. So that, that's so sit, that, sit, stay, sit thing, stay thing. I had a, with my last dog, I was, I taught him sit. Then I said, stay. And someone said, why, why are you telling him to stay? Like, if you told him to sit, doesn't that just mean sit? If it gets up two seconds later, it's not sitting anymore. So do you teach stay? Yeah. I will, I will enforce the duration of the sit later on. Okay. Yeah. But all, all I'm looking for early on is just some compliance. Okay. Just that he understands like, uh, uh, and, and, and it gets in, we, it would take forever to go through the whole process, but that early teaching him to stop is going to help you later because there's going to be times when you need to make your teenage dog six month, 10 month, year old, whatever you want to call a teenager as a dog, mm. you're going to, you're going to be asking him to stop, mm. whether it's walking on a leash and you're going to stop at a sidewalk or you're out in the field. If you end up getting into some real bird dog training down the road later on, you're going to want to steady this dog up to at least the word. Whoa means stop when you're moving. But if mm. you understand stop and it comes from you, or the word whoa. So most people use whoa in the bird in the pointing dog world. Right. If you use the word whoa early, when you start training him later, let's say with a little check cord on or a leash, and you say whoa, his brain goes right back to the kennel and the house door. He's like, I think that means I should stop. Right. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's not hard to do. It's just consistent, you know. So I brought my border collie many years ago brought him out to the local shotgun range and we just kind of stayed in the parking lot far away from the gunshots. And I figured yep. I'd try and slowly try and introduce my dog to the sound of gunfire. Right now, a border collie is not your prime hunting dog at all. Uh, nope. But I found that every single time I put a long gun up to my shoulder, my dog would come right beside me, lean hard into me and start shaking. So I probably did something wrong in the introduction to firearms with this dog at some point, And I definitely don't want to repeat that with a, a dedicated hunting dog. Right. How would you yeah. introduce them? Well, there's, there's several ways to, to do it. Um, probably the most one you're going to hear the most you'll see on the internet and on YouTube would be um, get this dog to chase like a pigeon or a, a pen raised bird that you can kind of control the flight of mm. pigeons. You don't control the flight of, but pigeons never land back on the ground. So right. it's just a, 
you take a, you get a pigeon, you let it fly. The dog's in mid pursuit. He's, he's, he thinks he's going to catch it. He can't, but the dog's running. And then in the background back here, you do some light, maybe blank gun, or if you don't have a blank gun, you got to have a friend another 50 yards behind with a, let's say a 410 shotgun or a 22 rifle. And mm. he still keeps the barrel pointed the opposite direction of the dog. Mm. But now this dog is seeing a bird as it's running and he's hearing boom, 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 little something in his head. Right. Like this in his eyes because of his instincts where the border collie doesn't have that chase. The I bet you if you'd have had a sheep and he was oh, hurting yeah. a sheep and you were shooting when he was young, he'd probably be like, man, that's the sound of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> right. Um, the, the thing about gun clubs, I'm telling you, a lot of people have done it. And I cannot tell those people it didn't work because they did it. Right. But what right. they also have is probably what, what I refer to as a bulletproof dog. Mm. Uh, there are some dogs out there that are just so not going to be bothered by noise that it would be literally, you'd have to work at making them gun shy, right? Right. You, okay. You'd almost have to take a, take a starting pistol and wake him up for breakfast with it in his ear. Like, Hey, boom, Hey, wake up and eat. You know? <laughs> so there's some dogs my first short hair, I didn't do any gun training. I took her hunting, but she was chasing a bird. I shot the bird. She associated the noise with the bird. The noise was always good for her. I, not, when did you get your first short hair? Huh? How old were you when you first got your, your first oh, hunting I was, dog? I was, well, I was in my twenties when I got one, but when I actually bought one, like with a purpose, yeah. I think I was 30, 32. Okay. I'm 64. So yeah, my, my first purchase, what I call a, a bread dog was probably 32 years ago, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Have you yeah. noticed a change in sort of training tactics over the years? Yeah. Mostly because in the beginning I didn't train it. You know, <laughs> I, I literally had one of the things I mentioned to you about dogs are the natural cooperation. What that is like, uh, I'm guessing that your border collie was pretty good running around you all the time, right? Didn't yep. didn't run off and leave you for 300 yards. He right. That's bred into the border collie, and that's one of the reasons they're very intelligent is they're very cooperative. Mm. So cooperation is the teamwork. The you don't it's it's not trained. It's the teamwork that the dog gives you. Mm. So that border collie probably had a good amount of cooperation. So my first dog had a lot of cooperation and she literally in her genetics, her search genetics were inherited from generations of good hunting dogs. So she searched at a pattern that something in her brain said, that's about right. I'll turn, I'll come back. Well, that's about, you know, so I got very lucky and then I bought a next dog, which had zero cooperation. Mm. So, so somewhere in my mid thirties, I said, I'm gonna have to learn how to train a dog because this dog, I, I don't. I think I took a trip to Canada one time to go uh, sharp tail hunting, and I never shot a, a bird over. Other people did, but I never shot a, a bird over my own dog. He just <laughs> he, he was just off doing his thing all day long. <laughs> somebody, well, somebody would see him on point. He goes, "Hey, Ron Haskell's over here on point." I'm like, "Good, shoot the bird for him. I don't care." <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I well, what about the whole male female thing? Is there any, is that an old wives tale? People saying you got to get a female hunting dog or is there any truth to that? I don't think so. I, I think one of the reasons if, if people are pro male, yeah, it's probably because a lot of the champions out there back in the day were male. And the mm. reason that is, is because they never go into a heat cycle. Right. So you've got that when it comes to competition, you've got that when it comes to everyday hunting you could get a heat cycle i just had one come up in north dakota with a dog mm. so i couldn't get her out with my male and if another dog would have you know it would have been a, a real real catastrophe so right um so some people will say one hunts better than the other uh, and some dogs i've been told this some females like guys better some females like the mom better but mm. that could also be some early imprinting of this stuff we talk about you know they just, they're like, oh, there's my boss. 
and right. they, they know the difference. So there's, I'll bet you there's just as many great stories about female hunting dogs as there is male hunting dogs. And you could find, it would be, uh, it would be as divided as the United States is politically right yeah. down the middle. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Well, you just came back from a hunting trip, didn't you? Mm -hmm. That was when yeah, we were chatting we, last year driving. Yeah. Um, I went to Northwest North Dakota. In fact, we went up so far Northwest that one of my friend's phones, the text said, welcome to Canada. Now, I never, <laughs> it didn't come up on my phone, but he said, yeah, I'm getting some text alert. Like, you know, something probably from the border, like some right. thing like welcome to Canada, make sure you stop. He's like, we're getting text from Canada here. So I didn't get that on my phone, but, um, so we were up there, we did some pheasant hunting far up there. We were chasing sharp tail grouse, uh, looking for Hungarian partridge, only found one covey. And we did a fair amount of duck hunting, which is probably our bigger success. And, but this trip was all just a trip with my best friend since we were in diapers and my neighbor and his boy. And it was like no pressure. There was no expectations on this trip. And it went down in the history of my trips is probably, you know, top five trips I've ever taken. So yeah, it was, it was fun. Yeah. You know, once you leave those expectations behind, if the expectation I find for me personally, if the expectation is the outcome, like what, how many animals are we going to harvest or are we going to be right. successful or not? Right. None of those trips ever rank with me. If the expectation is, man, we're just going to have a good time. Uh, inevitably yeah. we do. And if we end up harvesting something, that's just icing on the cake. And yeah. 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 And, and that's, I don't know. That's one of the things like, in, in the silver core podcast, I, I try and speak with, I find people who are inspirational and sort of uh, groundbreaking in, in their territory who are passionate about what they do. And I try my best to a learn from them and B share that passion with others. And more and yeah. more I'm finding that the most passionate and the people who are having the most fun are the ones who are just truly enjoying the process. And yeah, yeah. Like when I look at you, I watch you. So you've been on a few episodes of Meat Eater there and you're showing yeah. Steve how um, you're making uh, your own lead shot and mm. you got some nice shotguns that you're using. They're not always the latest, greatest, fanciest thing, but they got some character to them. I mean, that's one thing that I've really taken away from your podcast, from watching you is that you are the type of person that truly knows how to enjoy the process. I know. I'm just about to open a beer right now. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. I now, mean, is this, yeah? When uh, when you said meter, yeah, I was fortunate enough to be, uh, Steve was one of my, Steve and his brothers, but Steve specifically and his brother Danny were some of my earliest employees. He just got out of high school here where he lived. And yeah. I ran into his mom and she said, my sons are looking for work. And I'm like, I'm looking for kids. Yeah. And that's how we met. And so I was fortunate enough to get asked, when his production budget was much smaller way back in the day, he'd say, Hey, can you come out to, you know, here and here and do an episode? So, you know, he'd pay for my gas or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but so, yeah, I was lucky enough to do that with him. And, and that, that was, uh, that's actually the start of my podcast because Joe Rogan talked him into doing one. Yeah. And on one of our hunting trips in Texas that we filmed, he brought out podcast equipment and I thought you needed a studio. Right. I, I've, I've listened to podcasts for about four years at this point, And I thought, ah, I'm not going to find a studio in a, no, you know, I'm not good morning. Five minutes after seven, seven Oh five work, you know, <laughs> I'm not and then when I saw we could sit down at the kitchen table and drink beer, I'm like, oh, I'm doing a podcast as soon as I get yeah. home, you know, sold. <laughs> so what was your podcast background, Travis? I mean, because it's, it's a lot similar, but, but like, what made you start it? What made so, you start your? So I've, I started, I've got a training company, Silver Core Training, and we do, among other things, firearms training and hunter education and outdoor safety training and yep. Canadian based. And it's something that I love, but I've also got a desire to always create and build things. And I don't know if the, if it's the ADHD in me or w what it is, but I'm always looking at other things that I can do to kind of occupy my mind and occupy my time. And there was a growing trend that I found myself sort of, uh, 
being surrounded by in my industry. And I don't know if it's the same in the States, but in Canada, I mean, like there, there is a social stigma surrounding firearms. There's a social stigma that surrounds hunting and yeah. there's a lot of negativity as well. And if, and I, and I found that I was seeing a lot of that negativity, but in the same breath, there's a lot of positivity and there's a lot of great stories. And it's, I don't know if it's equal on both sides, but I thought, well, I want to be able to change my vantage point to be able mm -hmm. to see the positivity, relay yeah. that positivity. And so I started the silver core podcast and we're like, we're in the hunting or no, I don't think they have a hunting category. We're in the wilderness outdoors. section. Wilderness, What's that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the outdoor. Outdoors, yeah. 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 So we're, we're in that outdoor section on the, um, on the, uh, the iTunes chart, but we talk about everything under the sun. Usually it starts with hunting or firearms, but like we've had, uh, the last one we just let out was with a, um, British special forces commando. And he's talking about a selection process and the, and the rest. I had the inventor of the invisible cloak on the uh, podcast. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. He is so smart. And I thought, well, this is kind of camouflage related, right? This has got something yeah. to do with, uh, I mean, are you uh, talking about the Harry Potter cloak? Kind of like that. What this guy did. Okay. It's going to sound really <laughs> fancy. He took a, an array of lenticular lenses with a, a special viscous compound in between them to refract light in such a way that the person behind it is not seen, but what's in behind that person is seen. And I wouldn't believe it if I didn't see it. So yeah. he brings us in, he brings it into the, uh, into the studio that we have here. His name's uh, Guy Kramer. His grandfather invented the walkie talkie during, uh, during the war. And so lineage of really smart dudes. And it's funny because we're having this podcast and he keeps looking at his watch. Right. And this is one of my earlier podcasts. I'm like, oh man, I must be boring him. Right. And he keeps looking at his yeah. watch and I'm like, finally, I say, look at, if you got to be somewhere, I'm don't, don't let me hold you up. He's like, no, no, I'm yeah. really sorry. This is, um, uh, I'm getting my email notifications come through on the watch. Uh, that was Fox news. Uh, the other one was, I don't know, CNN or, or something else. Cause he just, yeah. uh, released a trademark and, and patent on his, this invisible cloak wow. thing. And you know what it is? Have you ever taken a, uh, you know, those stickers that you can look at, but you can tilt it and it changes the, uh, whatever you see on the sticker. It's like, yeah. as kids would play with them that those are lenticular lenses. And he basically took a couple of those things and he put an oil between it. And you can go online, you can see all the, um, the videos of people who've tried to copy it. Anyways, mm -hmm. positive fellow. Is that related to hunting and firearms? No, but it's a pretty cool story. Or I mean, like Colin Deller, he was attacked by a grizzly bear and fought it off with his pocket knife. I mean, that's yeah. not really, that's not really hunting, but hey. But it's a story. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna look that, that's how I started. Oh, well, I, <clears throat> I just was in North Dakota we didn't really bring layout blinds or anything for duck hunting. We just thought we'd hide in cattails. Yeah. And some of the ponds did not have cattails and we would just kind of sit. Yeah. That doesn't work real good for a duck, you know? Nope. An invisible cloak that you could just reflect whatever else is around you on. Yeah. I feel that. I bet you we're going to see that at Sportsman's Warehouse someday. <laughs> I think you will. I think you will. He tried to sell it to the military and he says, this shouldn't be in civilian hands. And he went around and uh, he did the circuit, but nobody really picked him up on it. And if you look at the videos that he has online, I mean, it's amazing what it does, but it's also got a different application. You can put it over top of solar panels and it, I don't know, I've, I don't know the exact number, but it like 10 times or 20 times the amount of light will come through onto your solar panels. So anyway, so... I got to ask, what was it like? So if he was in your studio yeah. and he pulled this over him, yeah. would you just be kind of seeing a broke up version of your studio? Like kind, kind of, I actually, I took a picture and it wasn't the best picture of him and I, and we're holding this thing in front of us. And mm -hmm. you can see the sort of the, the frame of the picture and behind us. And, but we kind of disappear. I mean, if you go on his website, you can see all the videos and they're, they're optimal. I mean, the things just disappear behind it. But right. I guess that's a bit of a tangent, but yeah, essentially the silver core podcast, I don't monetize it. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's ancillary benefits to having the silver core name out there, but I do it because yeah. I love talking with people like yourself. I love yeah. learning things and I want to surround myself and others with the positive things that are, are in both of our realms. Yeah. 
I, I'm sure you get those emails that like, yep, that's why I'm doing the podcast, right? Somebody will write you from a guest and you really feel like, you know, philanthropic's the wrong word. That's like for money. You really right. feel like, well, this guy would not have wrote me an email if he didn't mean it. And it's right. almost sometimes a little gushy. You know, you're like, wow, I can't believe I got you to get back into the hunting world and got you to buy a dog or got you to like in your case, like, yeah, you know, I used to shoot and I'm going to shoot again. Or so, right. yeah, sometimes that's all you need for payment, you know, and uh, it's, it's fun. It is. Yeah, it is fun. And, and really, I don't know, at the, at the end of the day, everyone's got to make a living. Everyone's got to uh, do something to retire and have the nice things that you want to have. But the real positive change that you can affect in the community typically isn't, it, it isn't something that comes from directly from your job. And it's something yeah. that as a byproduct of your passion, your endeavor will probably end up generating revenue. But if you, yeah, yeah, if you look at it from a revenue standpoint, I think that's, yeah. I, it's a dead end. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you've what, 2012, I think it was when you started your podcast. No, no, it was 2015. I'm going to be in my, uh, or I, I've done it for almost seven years now. So next year will be my eighth year, starting my eighth year. Did you find uh, it hard to start or were you just natural oh, like yeah. you are now? Well, I, I found it like, I want to do it. And like, Who's going to be my first guest? Right? Right. right. So I got my oldest hunting buddy to come over here and drink beer with me. Yeah. And we just started rehashing a trip to South Dakota. I'm like, well, I guess that's what it is. But you mentioned something about me and, and like making my own shells. And I, I don't want to, I'm not calling myself genuine, but I never change. You can ask my wife. I never change. <laughs> I'm sure she'll and agree. Just like drinking a beer or smoking a cigar. I'm like, no, I'm not going to not do that because that's what I do. And that just resonates with people. Like, I mean, I say sarcastically, I'm trying to bring smoking back. I think we had a better, <laughs> but that's because when everybody smoked, it was just a better country back then. So maybe it was the country. Maybe the cigarettes <laughs> and the cigars did not have anything to do with it. But maybe we've banned this so bad that some people that might be cool were like, God, if I could just have a cigarette, I'd be great. You know, <laughs> I, I hate censorship, you know, I agree. And uh, again, I know if you're sitting in a restaurant, nobody wants to smell a, sure. a cigarette coming off the ashtray. Yeah. But when I grew up, you, you smoked on planes. Yeah. You, know? you smoked in the last five rows. Now, at that age, I don't think I was smoking. Didn't seem to bother me, but that's because my mom blew cigarette smoke into my baby blanket. So, I, I mean, it obviously didn't bother me. <laughs> Reminds you of mom. Reminds you of mom. But so, yeah, being, and being real, like, like you said, you're, you're just so passionate about what you do that you want. You're not trying to convert people. You're just trying to celebrate the passion, kind of. Right. Yeah. And by default, you end up surrounding yourself with more like-minded people who have that yeah. same passion and same drive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like I think most podcasters, if they, I don't know if they did a murder mystery or whatever, it's kind of like we all served a little term together, figuring out how to do it. You know, that first, that first episode. Right. Like next week. How did you pick a first guest for, for, uh, for yours, for Silvercore? Just like you, I had a couple of friends. And so one, <laughs> well, both of them are retired Vancouver city police. And, yeah. and from the training background, I look at it and I said, well, I figure every single episode I put out should have some educational components. Like if I'm asking for somebody's time to listen to me for X amount of time, what value right. am I imparting to them? And so I figured, well, it's got to have, um, some training components. And so I'd kind of draft out all the different things that we'd try and have, uh, covered, or it's got to have some entertainment value. And yeah. it, it wasn't until, uh, sitting down with, well, there's a couple, but, uh, I don't know, uh, Brad Brooks from, uh, our galley. And I remember before doing the podcast with him, just like with you, we have a little bit of preamble. We talk back and forth. He's like, yeah. You know, if you want to talk about whatever technical things th that I do with hunting, I'm sure, yeah, we can do it. I mean, like they make the game bags and yeah, we could talk about that. But honestly, I'm more interested just to tell stories. I want to see what you're about and I'd love to be able to share some of my stories. And I'm like, yeah. 
just like you're saying this, this whole world of social media that's been so polished and everybody knows it's fake, right? For the most part, you look at all this polish, they want to see something real and they want to be able to connect with, with the people that they're listening to or they're watching. And if they happen to be entertained and educated in the process, even better. It's a bonus. It's a bonus. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll bring guests on that are not usually entertaining, but very informative. Mm. And that's a podcast where I want them to do a lot of the talking. Right. Like a, a habitat biologist. Um, right. I've had several of those on. And I'm kind of like when I got them on and they're on a roll about habitat and biology and pollinators, I'm like, oh, right. Oh. You know, I, it, so then I feel like one of my own listeners. Yeah. Like, like that's why they like this, because I just learned something. They got to like it, you know. And then with, in my particular case, because I'm known for being such a, a drinker, um, <laughs> well, I am. I mean, my dad said, I, I drove a beer truck in Chicago for two years when I was uh, 20 and 21 years old. Yeah. So I drove a Paps Blue Ribbon uh, tractor trailer and delivered beer to stores. Awesome. And you, you cannot imagine how much beer. I think the other day, a buddy of mine, uh, best friend since I was, you know, like I said, right around diapers. We don't remember ourselves, but we were next door neighbors. And he goes, how much beer do you think you drank? I'm like, I don't know. So I got my calculator out. And I didn't drink early. I wasn't like a 13-year-old delinquent, you know. Right, like I didn't right. smoke a cigarette until I was old enough to buy cigarettes. Yeah. But my mom smoked. And she said, oh, you're smoking? I'm like, well, yeah. She goes, well, I certainly can't tell you not to. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, when it came to beer drinking, I was I was probably I was not like the high school party kid. You know, we were out trying to chase bugs and flies and try to hunt and trap. And even though we we're in the city of Chicago, but when it came to like drinking, when I was able to say get into some place or go to Wisconsin where it was only eighteen, I took to that like a like a you know a fly to shit. Yeah, <laughs> and then I drove this beer truck and. The, the sales, the job is called driver salesman. I, it was a union. It's a union. I think it was, I think it was local 743 in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I think it was. And so my first day I'm with this other driver and I'm his helper, which means I got to do all the work. Right. Of course. 12 packs on the dolly, bring them down the stairs, stock the, you know, you don't stock the shelves, but you, you make sure the beer's in the shelf where people can see it. And old Bill was over at the bar having a, short glass of beer and that's right after breakfast because <laughs> the bartender would pour him a, a shorty glass yeah and i he'd get, he'd get the bill made out and he'd say you want a glass i'm like i'm dying from work i'm like, yeah let me have a glass <laughs> okay that would go on all day long all day oh, long wow. every five wow. days a week and i'm not saying i have it. good friends of mine have literally told me ron I don't think I've ever seen you out of control in your life. I've seen you on stage, mm. you know, might have seen the lampshade once, you know, right. but I have some, and I drink very light. I drink light beer. You know, I mm. don't drink high content beer. I don't drink alcohol, like what I call alcohol. I right. don't drink wine. I don't drink bourbon. I'll sip on something once in a blue moon, but I have some innate, maybe it's just because of conditioning. I've been pulled over three times for suspicion of DUI. Yeah, and never, and never, and never blew illegal. Now right. I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> how to explain that? Some horseshoes, maybe I don't know. Horseshoe up my ass. The, yeah. the one I got under the seat. The and again, I was. I know at those times that I had alcohol in my breath. Yeah, but but I wasn't in a bar, you know, drinking. But I'd be. I was on a hunting trip once, and I got pulled over. And of course, you could smell it on my breath. Right. And this cop made me do three times into this straw. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, I, he was literally like, I don't understand this. You know? <laughs> like he was taking the, the thing and going like, this thing's broken. <laughs> so, Good genetics. Anyway, so I, that goes, just goes back to, I, I, I always am who I am, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I, I mean, I could tell from talking to you the other day and, you're like kind of guy we'd bump in if we sat down on a plane together. It's not the guy you're not going to talk to. It's the guy that's going to make the whole flight go by in 
Totally. You know, blink of an eye. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, it sounds like a dream job. I don't know why you left that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a good job. It was a good job. I unfortunately, I don't, I don't, I forget what, I think it was a Monday morning. I took what was called a barrel truck. I had to do a barrel run. So it's a different truck. It's a straight bed truck. And I was starving. I was probably out all day at a barbecue or whatever. Got up more I was starving, hungry. And I, I pulled into a McDonald's drive through and Thank God there was a car under the canopy at the drive through window. But so I stopped with my, the front end of this old international, you know, man, literally manual steering yep. box truck. And yep. I'm right behind this car. But what I didn't realize was that the sign that said clearance up uh -huh. above, it said like <laughs> clearance nine, six. Yeah. I was just thinking McDonald's. So when I pulled up and stopped, the box in my truck was literally up against that sign. Mm. I didn't know it. And when that car pulled up, I let off the clutch and all the glass started breaking and coming down under the hood uh, of my truck. No. <laughs> so I didn't take the canopy down or anything. Yeah, yeah. Know? But uh, it gave my boss some pause for keeping me going. So <laughs> I, went back into, I went back into construction. <laughs> gotcha. So that must have been what you hired uh, Steve and his bros for was be in construction, right. was it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Got Steve, it. Yeah. Steve and Danny and Matt. Um, so yeah, I, I just jumped back into construction and started my own crew. But I mean, what is your background military or law enforcement or what's yours? Cause I couldn't, I know on that podcast you did with April Vokey and I'm a huge fan of April Vokey. Yeah. Um, you said she asked you a question that was like, well, you're kind of known as the gun guy. You're like, no, I don't want to be known as the gun guy. <laughs> well, I, I've well, always. What's your background? What's your background? So, yeah, my background, aside from being in the Army Cadet program as a uh, as a teenager and going through that, that's the closest to military I've ever been. Um, mm -hmm. I've got family background in law enforcement. My father and grandfather were law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I just was uh, a bit of a delinquent in school, in elementary school, in high school, and wasn't really fitting in. And I did like to blow things up. And nowadays after 9-11, that's uh, not something that would wear well. But back in the day, it was just, hey, this is chemistry or this is engineering or this is. Yeah. I, I, and uh, actually, one of the fellows, he was the um, head of the police academy here at the Justice Institute in British Columbia. And he says, Trav, you know, why don't you come on and take a few courses? They might be right up your alley. And. Uh, they're firearms related courses. So at 18 years old, I started packing a gun on my hip and was working as an armored car guard. And I thought, Hey, this'll, this'll be a good step in the right direction for, uh, for law enforcement or military. I flew over yeah. actually to the UK cause I was going to join the British military. Um, but I went through the process with our local police department, Vancouver police I scored top of my intake on the written. I came third on the physical cause you can actually see uh, based on where you place on everybody else. Right. And they said, well, Trav, you're, you're kind of young. Come on back when you got a bit more experience. And I've always kind of been entrepreneurial minded. I mean, I, my first job I had, I was performing magic at kids' birthday parties when I was in grade four, grade five. Right. I mean, <laughs> I'm like, what, what can I do? I can make some money. And, and even before that, when I was working for the armored car company, I was welding up all their hand trucks for them because I thought, well, geez, how can I make a couple extra bucks? And then I started doing their gunsmithing for them. Went down to Springfield, Massachusetts to the Smith and Wesson factory and got myself trained up on their, their wheel guns. And of course, I guess Springfield's moving now. I think they're going to Tennessee or something. Mm -hmm. So always had that sort of background, that knowledge base. And I decided, well, geez, maybe my life experience will be, I'll start a business and, you know, most businesses fail. And so if I go through that and I suck at it, then I can show that life experience and go back and try the policing route. I didn't suck. It took off and I've, I've never looked back. And then we do work with law enforcement for firearms repair and maintenance. Uh, we do work with like the armored car industry doing use of force training and I do, I'm a subject matter expert with the courts for both defense and crown counsel for firearms and use of force and weapons related things. But that's not, I don't know. That's just one aspect of, of what I do. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. call you the, the construction guy. I know that you can do it. 
Yeah. Right? That is what that is what I'm probably the best at. You're right. You right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you're that was yeah, because I assumed when I when I talked to you and I was watching you in April on your podcast, I'm like, oh, he's a Navy SEAL or something. You know, nope. or a uh, or a, 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 a Royal Marines or so. I I just assumed, <laughs> right? And I'm like, nah. He looks like he's about six foot three and ripped. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, this, guy, <laughs> this guy's gonna tear his tear someone's head off. You know, you know. Do you have a fight. You have a fighting background. Do I you, do. You fight yeah. I so both non professionally and when I say non professionally, I got into a lot of fights when I was younger, and then well, in a more organized perspective, I got into. Um, uh, Muay Thai kickboxing and uh, jujitsu and Aikido. You, yeah? And then Arnis. Arnis was kind of a neat one. But you do jujitsu, yeah. don't you? Six. Arnis. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, look at you. I, I uh, see, I, I did not hear, I did not do any research on that. But, you know, like you said, when you meet somebody, it's like there's something about him. It's If it's not military, it's martial arts. Mm, yeah. So, and, uh, so, I uh, I got into I took a some Shotokan class in high school at somebody other school, but when I it, there's a little rabbit hole. But when I got divorced, I was married for a very short time to the very wrong person. No right. kids, no harm, no fault. But yeah. when I got divorced, I wanted to go kick this other guy's ass. Sure, know? and. Then I was told that, well, he's a state police officer and he protects the governor of Illinois. Well, that's not going to be a good guy to go against. So now right. I got, I said, I'm going to get into Mark. So I took Kenpo yep. and I was in that for a long time. I have a, you mentioned ADD and ADHD. I've got some version of that because I can't, I got to reread and reread, <laughs> reread. Mm -hmm. So learning all the katas and techniques took me a long time. I earned a brown belt in that. Um, fought competitively but not for money in amateur you know like tournaments right and i would right. do the forms i would do the weapons so when you said our niece you know yeah. um i would do and then i would also do the sparring or kumite yeah so i did that and did that in chicago for a long time when i was still in chicago found schools up in michigan and then with having three daughters and it was always there was always a heavy bag in my life there was always a heavy bag yes there was always a on the road, go to a, I'd go to a dojo and say, what's your, what's your walking policy? Can I walk in for a week? Mm. And I would go take ta Taekwondo. I was sure. never a big fan of the, I wasn't built for Taekwondo. Just, I'm not a leggy, well-stretched guy, mm. but I mean, and I would even enter tournaments in other cities. So like, I, it's like so weird. And then when you said jujitsu, listen to damn Joe Rogan. I started jujitsu at age 58. Holy crow. Yeah. Because and of Joe Rogan. Because of Joe Rogan. Yep. Yeah. That's the power of the and, podcast, right? Uh, yep. And that's why I started my podcast because he got Steve to start a podcast. So yeah. that man has no idea how influential he's been on me. That's and yeah. jujitsu is by far. It's the most I've never enjoyed a martial art as much as jujitsu because it's so you can put a hundred percent into it. And if you're careful, not get hurt, you know? Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. Muay Thai, that's some deadly shit there. Oh, but, it's fantastic for your conditioning. Oh yeah. But you can't show a guy a technique at full strength just to show him the technique. <laughs> the right. technique involves breaking his face on your knee. Right? Yes. Yes. But in jujitsu, you can get yourself locked up, tied up, choked out, arm barred, and you can tap. Yeah, but you had that as close to feeling as so. I at age sixty, no, fifty-eight, nine, sixty. Age sixty-one took me a long time. I only went a couple days a week. I earned my blue belt, which was like Good enough to send me to the belt. Yeah. Good for you. That's fantastic. Yeah. Are, I don't even. Are, know you, I, are you still training? When COVID hit, the school closed, mm. and the school near me, I, I did find a school last summer that's near me. I walked in, did a couple of classes. I liked the class, and it's probably as soon as hunting season's over, mm. I'm going to, I talked to the, to the professor there, and I'm going to join up and get back there a couple of days a week, because 
Yeah, uh, it, it doesn't get your legs in shape for hunting, but boy, it gets your it gets your heart going. <laughs> it gets your heart going like crazy. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> well, you know, I a little bit of a segue here, but uh training. So I've got the training background, training company, that's what I do. And I've always had a keen interest in online training. And I happen to know that uh, you've got some background in online training as well, don't you? Well, now I do. Uh, two years ago, I didn't. But um, yeah, a friend of mine who's a dog trainer in this area in West Michigan, he would come on my podcast and we would do question and answer uh, segments. And it would, they were always well received. You, I'm sure you, you, know, you get certain guests on. And in the beginning, you always look at your download numbers. You're like, oh, sure. people are listening. People are listening. Yep. I don't look at it anymore. And uh, hold on, I got to turn that ringer off. I don't look at downloads anymore until I load up an episode and it pops up there on my feed. Mm. And, it, and it's always pretty consistent. Um, hang on, I got to get that off. And so um, the guy that I used to bring on, Justin McGrail, he was a really good dog trainer. And I tried to talk him into doing like some YouTube clips and stuff like that. Just mm. let's show some people some of the stuff you do. He's like, he, and he is not a computer guy. He's not a phone guy. He's much younger than me, but you'd swear he was born in the 1800s. You know, awesome. I think, I, yeah, the, the phone to him is just, someone's got to call me. So I have to have a phone, but that's all he wants it for. Right. Right. If a tin can and a string would work, he'd be happy with it. My kind of guy. And, uh, <laughs> So, so he looked at some YouTube videos. He's like, no, no. He said, I'm, I'm not, I am not putting myself out on YouTube and sorry, Ron. I, I, I enjoy doing the podcast with you now. I, I, I've got a little rhythm going. I, I enjoy the questions. He said, and then one day we we're kicking something around and it just turned into like, well, what if we filmed what you do? So it's not like the only way to train a dog. It's just the way he trains his dogs. Right. Uh, he guides in the past. He guides for like six weeks in Montana, six weeks in uh, Arizona. Now on those trips, there's some non-hunting season time. But anyway, this guy used to be on the road 12 weeks a year, just guiding wild bird hunts in Arizona and Montana. So, I mean, he is as real as you can get when it comes to wild bird dog tra and, and the training it takes to make that dog. So we started coming up with this, you know, cockamamie idea that we're going to have an online training school. We didn't know what that yeah. meant, you know, but in now a, a year and a half of filming and uh, eight months of editing, it's, it's out there. It's called the Upland Institute. It's based on <clears throat> all the dogs we use are pointing dogs. So, I mean, for the few listeners that you or I would have, they'd be like, okay, I know what a German short hair is a pointer. And a Labrador is a flushing dog. But there's a lot of same stuff in those dogs. Just one happens to flush a bird, one happens to point. So this course is tailor-made for a pointing dog. Okay. But it's also tailor-made for, it, if you got a new dog, it's tailor-made for, like, what do I do with this dog do I, when it's young? When you asked early on, how do I, you know, when does training start? Well, it starts early. Right. There's a lot of little things that, you know, I've known this guy for a long time. I'm like, I didn't know you did that with your puppy when he was that age. Like just these little things. Interesting. And so we filmed it and then we filmed it when they got older and we filmed and then we just went into, we went into the weeds with it and we felt that we had enough content to, you know, create, you know, we had somebody create a website. And so I had no background in online training. Yeah. But you know, I kind of do now, but like, how, how did, how did you do? I mean, did you go at it like with your eyes closed, like we do with podcasts or were you doing live training and then turned it to online? So uh, yes and no. So okay. when we talk about the whole ADHD thing and I've joked in other podcasts about it. So I was diagnosed with ADHD at a young age. I don't even know if I have ADHD, but it would just seem to be the common thing that people would diagnose with. But I do know that I'm always looking at new things and I'm always trying to invent or create. And, and on the training side, I did not do well in school, which is really funny for a guy who now owns a training company. But I was able to take like from the cadet side, the uh, man management method of instruction and all the, the military 
uh, techniques for providing training, whether it be theoretical or practical training. And I yeah. thought, man, they kind of got it dialed in. They can take people from the all different spectrums from the lowest common denominator to bright people, yeah. get them all on the same page, get them trained up, get them proficient and get them going. So I, I looked at that and by around 2004, 2005, I was already certified as a, uh, a master instructor within the firearms training here. It's a designation from our, our CMP for um, just some really basic sort of safety training that we do, but I'm able to train other trainers. And I started having talks with the uh, uh, different government officials about saying, you guys got to put your stuff online. You have to have some sort of consistency in the, in the delivery and the approach and looking at these benefits. And, you know, it kind of fell on deaf ears, despite all the different uh, people I was talking with and they're flying people uh, from back East over here and, I thought, man, they're just pumping me for information and they're going to go do it themselves. So I, I started delving deeper and deeper into the, into sort of the online training world and there's pros and cons. I mean, you can learn a lot in an in-person course that you wouldn't get online and vice versa. Right. Vice versa. Um, totally. So how do we, how do we speak to those pros in the online? Because uh, being a, uh, a small business owner uh, and having employees, our reach is only so far. We've got the lower mainland. We've got our locations. You can only get so many people in a classroom and you can only have so many instructors, right? And instructors will have a, um, a turnover rate. How can oh, we yeah. sort of systemize that so people can get the quality of information and sort of without the downside of that administrative side? And that's where the, that's sort of where the online training kind of came in. And I actually, I took it from an approach. I wanted to build a SaaS or a software as a service. And I had, uh, at, at the end, I think it was five different programmers building something for me. And I had zero business building a SaaS. And I sunk a lot of money <laughs> and time and energy into this only to realize there's other ways we can, we can skin this cat. And right. so, uh, the online training has been a passion and right now we hold the contract for provincial hunter education training in British Columbia. And every dollar that I have coming back in from that goes back into new hunter recruitment, hunter retention, getting people into the activity that, I, that I enjoy and hopefully wow. try and introduce them to some of the reasons for that enjoyment. Right. We've tripled, we've tripled our province's uh, take on uh, what they've been bringing in, which is, fantastic and massive new hunter retention or recruitment and hunter retention. So that's sort of a passion project. And I'm sure if I keep following that passion at some point, there will be a monetary reward at the end, but that's not why I do it. Sort of long winded, but I think that kind of touches on why yeah. I got into it. Did you, did you run into the, the like, oh my God, we have to film this and on camera. And is, is it, yes, it, that, that's that like, oh shit moment. Like, oh, I, you know, no wonder why I can watch television. There's a lot of stuff that goes on to make yeah. that television show. Right. And a yeah. lot of footage just never gets seen by anybody, you know. Our, but. our very first course that we put together and put online and I put a, a press release out on Newswire for it. And, uh, we hired a fellow to do sort of the filming and production of it. And so I, I learned a lot about the process of like scripting and yeah. storyboarding and, and kind of what's involved. I also learned, holy crow, some of these people that get into this, I don't know, I'm using air brackets for people who are listening, but this Hollywood mentality or this Hollywood world. I have right. never had somebody be able to push my buttons the way that this guy could. And <laughs> holy crow, it was like we would get somebody trained up and I would find a, an appropriate male model and female model or actor or actress for, for different things. And, and on the night before he, he would fire them and he says, Oh, I met somebody out at the Surrey Skytrain station and we're going to give them the job. And I mean, it was, it was all over the board and I, I was so frustrated by the end. We had a final product. It cost a lot more than I wanted that I went out and I purchased my own audio equipment, my own video equipment. And I figured if one man can do it, another can do it. I'm going to figure this out. And we started proceeding with our, our future courses from that perspective. Yeah. yeah. You know, 
and that's what it's I, I'm sure that this was not a COVID thing. It could be a COVID thing, you know, because of everybody being able to go out. And yeah. certainly it's way more popular. I mean, kids are going to school online, which yeah. that was unheard of. You know, I mean, I'm sure there were some college courses that you could take online back in the day. I always heard the commercials. Yeah. Um, but but getting into that is it's it's almost like sometimes you're like you're so proud of it, and the other part of it is like well, why wouldn't people just come to me and learn this? Well, but then you could reach, like you said, you can reach so many more people, what you've done with the numbers for, you know, the hunter safety. Like, and I know there's an online hunter safety. Now I'm yep. old enough that most places I don't go, I go, I don't need a hunter safety card. Right. In fact, in fact, I remember I took my twin daughters and my youngest daughter to Kansas. So that would have been well, I don't know, a long time ago. They were, just getting her driver's permit. They were 15. Yeah. So, and they're in their mid thirties. So 15 plus years ago. And I had not hunted Kansas previously. I've hunted South Dakota, North Dakota, Texas, Oklahoma, Mount, you know, all over, never hunted Kansas. Yeah. So I go and, you know, there was, there was computers then. So you could do some <laughs> research. You know, it wasn't that long ago, but I went on there and it said, enter your hunter safety number. And it said, or check here if you're old enough. I'm like, well, right. of course I'm old enough. Well, I already put my information down up in the top. I hit it, the button, didn't say, of course I'm old enough, but it was, you know. <laughs> and then it said, little red line came up, you are not old enough. I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> really? I'm not old enough. <laughs> you know, they didn't even have good automatic shotguns when I started hunting. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, turns out I was like eight months too young to just go to the state of Kansas and then trust me to have firearms. Uh, so I had to take a hunter safety course. So come on. To, yeah. And so my kids did it in high school, which was great. You know, yeah. they had boater safety. You know, we're in a rural area of Michigan. They had boater safety, hunter safety, and all kinds of things, you know, they took. Yeah. And, uh, so I had to I had to do a hunter safety class when I was like in my forties. Like ah, you I'm I know more about guns than you do. But but it would did you learn anything? To, not really. Uh, eh? Not really. It was pretty rudimentary. Yeah. You know? Um, and the instructor that actually that I know, he's like probably shouldn't say it, but I think statute of limitations ran out. He goes, we're not need we don't need to go in the field for the field right. part. Right. Right. But you've answered all the questions on the, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I did. But I think that hunter safety, I think it, that is so cool that that's out there for the kids because it's not going to teach you how to shoot a bird, but it's going to drill that one or two things in your head, you know. You know and I drilled I, it to my kids. It's that, where's that barrel pointing? Where right. is that barrel pointing? And if, Number if one. that's what it does, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, we tell yeah. people, I said, you know, if you violate all of the other safety principles, if your finger is on right. the trigger, you didn't check to see if it was loaded, you trip, you fall, it goes bang. But at the very least, you control yeah. that muscle direction. You've got no yeah. loss of life. You have minimal property damage. Your ears are ringing. People are screaming at you. Right. But that's the fundamental of, of, all of all of that safety. But I, th I think for yeah. like my, my personal standpoint, and I'm, you know, I'm still learning but for sort of, let's say, talk about online hunter education, I think it could do so much more than what it currently does. I mean, yeah. uh, we live in such a litigious society that everybody's now says, well, geez, like you look at the ERT members. Well, are you door kicker certified? If you're not door kicker certified, you can't get a door in, right? Everyone figures mm -hmm. if you have a certificate or some sort of piece of paper over your head, then, then you're going to be competent and proficient in what you do. Or maybe it's from the other side. Now an organization can say, hey, we've done our part, right? We've done our due diligence. No one right. can come after us. Right. But, but what if they use hunter education in a way to um, to motivate and inspire people to get outside? And what if it was put out in such a way that maybe wasn't necessarily strictly hunter education, but that could be a component of it? Because any yeah. course that you do about hunting, hunter education, it's not going to teach you how to hunt. It'll teach you how to be safe. and It'll teach you how to be legal. But what about the vast majority of people that go to school that maybe just want to learn how to hike and be 
have some knowledge of the flora and fauna around them or yeah. be safe yeah. in bear country. And yeah. I, I, I think if it was, um, maybe modularized and put out in, in such a way that, uh, could have attract a much wider audience than the whole yeah. conversation around hunting right. could be talked about, maybe, yeah. maybe talked about in a different light. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I, I kind of, I, I envy the kids that can do it. I not envy them, but I'm glad they do it, but it would be cool if that class was just more than just what it was. Right. Like a little right. bit more like almost like a teaser commercial for a movie. Right. There you go. So you, you're installing the passion, right? Right. Right. You're, you're, you, cause you could, you know, you remember going to school and the, the guy would put a movie on, it was health education. You're like, totally, you know, totally. but, and I'm being obviously way off the rails here. If health <laughs> education had two or three minutes of a, all right, let's say soft porn, not, not porn, but, <laughs> uh, two or three minutes of like, well, the kids would be paying like, attention. Oh, pretty good. See those students would be like, Oh, I, and, I, and I'm going to be care and I'm going to be careful too, you know? So, right. you know, your hunter safety course has to expand into like some hunting segments, you know, some, right. some ducks dropping out of the sky, the, right. the tailgate. Talk. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone says, Oh man, why can't you teach whatever? Right. Oh, I wish we went to the range on this, uh, like in the, in Canada in order to get a firearms mm -hmm. license, you have to have some basic safety training, you know, but the laws and history and, mm -hmm. and actions and safety and, and all the rest. And they say, Oh man, we, sh we should have a, a live fire portion. And some countries do that. Like Germany will have that. Yeah. And I say, well, you know, each one of those would be a barrier to lawful firearms owners. Um, yes. there are important points that people can know about, but what if you instill a passion, some just rudimentary fundamentals and right. instill sort of the drive to want to learn more. And right. that's what we try and do with our, our courses. Cause I mean, we got YouTube, you can learn anything you want on YouTube or through Google. The issue yeah. is, is you got to sort through a lot of garbage to get there. Right. And like right. where your course is really good. This is a particularly curated course. For someone like it's curates all of this information. It's not the only right. way to train your hunting dog, but it's a proven method that works for, for you and your friends and the people that, right. that you, and I, and I think there's, that's where the value is in, in online training, yeah. condensed curated, uh, content that'll get somebody where they need to go in, in a quick way. When you look at it from a certification standpoint and checking boxes, or I got to sit in front of my computer for X amount of time. I mean, you're probably like me. If I have to do an online course, I'm going to go to the very end and do the test and see what do I know and what don't I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, just like we were in school. Totally, right? <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. you want to be somewhere else. I, I didn't want to be in right, school. Right, right, right. Well, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to work on the uh, the the Better Hunter Trainer Safety online school. And you leave it up to me to work on the, uh, our, our tagline is be a better trainer. Oh, I love it. I'm going to, I'm going to sign up for your course and I'm going to put links in the podcast, uh, both on the podcast and in YouTube. So anyone else who wants to check it out can, uh, yeah, can I appreciate on it. it. Oh, mm -hmm. totally. All right. Well, is there anything else we should be chatting about? Um, uh, I mean, nothing unless we got into like rabbit holes, but you know, no, I mean, it was, it was good. It was great to meet. I, I feel like we could go on the mat together. I, yeah. I gotta go. Yeah. I still gotta. I still gotta roll in a gi. I, I don't like no gi because I'm old. I still need something to hang on to. A collar, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. But I feel like if we ever bumped into each other, you say, "Hey, let's get on the mat and let's roll." You know. And there, to me, like you know, the jujitsu world. Yeah. That's kind of like the hunting world. Like there's like a weird brotherhood. To totally is. Arts in general, but jujitsu is like, oh my god, it is the it's the best thing I ever did in my life. I just wish I'd have started earlier, you know. Um, well, I, I I cannot tell people like I could not. The, the last class I went to, when you said that I have I am I still in it? Well, I was yeah. out of it completely for the co the big COVID part, and I really missed going. And I'm in worse shape now than you know because I haven't done it. But I can I can get that back. But when I went to this class of this school that's in my town now. 
because I used to travel to go to do this. It was an hour away, and uh, which you know in Canada may not be a long ways, but it was. An That's hour just away. down the road. Come on. Yeah, yeah, it's just like going to it's like going to Montana. Yeah, I'm going to go to Billings <laughs> today, right? But on the second class, I was there, and I was. I was really sucking some air pretty good. You know, I was like, mm. I could still remember how to defend myself, but I wasn't getting very far. Mm. And the the professor, you know, he's very, very nice guy. And uh, I get to, he says, Ron, you got to roll again. Come on, get another partner. I said, hang on a minute. I literally, being my chatty Cathy on stage self, I said, oh, hold on, everybody. Hold on. <laughs> I said, could some of you kids bring your dads tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Just some of you bring your dads in here, so I got someone near my decade to, to roll with. But no, I, I that's if it. I'd tell you, other than dogs, bird hunting, and people, like jujitsu is number four. You know, awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think we're going to have to get into some rabbit holes maybe at another time if you'll have me. But uh, oh hell yeah, we'll we'll go down the. We'll go down my gun stuff, your gun stuff, martial mm -hmm. arts stuff. Uh, we could touch on ADHD because they didn't diagnose me because I didn't sit still long enough to be diagnosed. You know? Bang, you're out the door. We can talk about the Beretta that I sold, nice over under, like e -E -E -L <laughs> that uh, I sold for 800 bucks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There we go. I yeah, think that'll be go. fun. Let's, let's, let's make sure we do it once or twice a year. It sounds great, Ron. Well, thanks very much. This has been a lot of fun. It's been a pleasure. I made, I made another new friend. You know.